You're listening to Affect Autism, where Affect is the number one tool we use in supporting child development through playful interactions. If you're a caregiver looking to implement your own floor time approach, please check the ICDL parent website at the Interdisciplinary Council on Development and Learning for a free virtual floor time consultation or for the weekly parent support meetings. We aim to help you implement your program at home using the Developmental Individual Differences Relationship-Based Model, or DIR, taking into account your child's developmental level their individual differences, and in using your relationship with them to help promote and support their development. Hello, this week I have two special guests with us. You may recall Donnie Welch, who is a teaching artist who runs inclusive and accessible writing workshops. We had him on the podcast before discussing the poetry workshops he did at the Rebecca School. Donnie has started running virtual classes with colleagues from Rebecca School. And one of these classes is a free pay what you can virtual art class for people of all ages and all abilities called Open Studio for All, where they play music, they offer a space for creative people of all ages and abilities to draw, write, or just hang out and be a part of the community on Zoom. At the end of the group, they offer a space for anyone who wants to share their work, but it's completely optional. And also joining us today is Tanya Steinfeld, who is an art teacher and an art therapist at Rebecca School and an advanced floor time provider currently training to be an expert provider. The idea for Open Studio stems from work she was doing at Rebecca already that they then adapted for a broader audience. And according to Donnie, Tanya is a brilliant facilitator who has been teaching art through a DIR floor time lens for years. Of course, that's the d developmental individual differences relationship-based model of Dr. Stanley Greenspan. So welcome to both of you. Hey. Thank you. Nice to have you back, Donnie. So, yeah, thank you so I'm, much. yeah, I'm very eager to hear what's been happening. So we spoke, it must be over a year ago now, about mm -hmm. the poetry workshops. So I'm curious, um, and for anyone who hasn't heard those, if you go to affectautism.com and type in poetry in the search, you'll find the podcast I did with Donnie. Just an amazing use of DIR floor time um through poetry and and how he works with children across developmental capacities in the dir model so it's really amazing i encourage everyone to listen to that so how is that going and how did you move into the art oh well thanks so much for the kind words and for having me back and then we bring tanya on too so it really all started back in March when a lot of schools and institutions were shutting down as a result of COVID. Um, I had a lot of partnerships, including with Rebecca School and with the Bronx Museum of the Arts that I needed to finish out and finish out virtually. So I started doing a lot of um, virtual learning with the Rebecca School. And I also started just producing videos to be released for the museum and a few other partners. And that really got me thinking about how to take art and in particular poetry, the art form I work in more into the virtual space. Um, for some health reasons, I can't do the kind of hybrid work that's currently happening in education. And I know that there are a lot of students and a lot of adults who also can't partake in the hybrid work happening in schools or day habs or institutions. So I wanted to think about how to meet those needs and meet that population. And while I was teaching virtually at Rebecca, I was working with Tanya. Her and I have collaborated for two years now on a few different things. We presented at a um, New York branch of the National Writing. I forget what the acronym is, but it was at Lehman College uh, up in the Bronx. And it was a presentation for the New York Writing Project on a studio class we were doing, which was based on Exquisite Corpse, which is a kind of surreal game where someone builds one part of a body and then the paper gets passed and then it builds and builds and I'll leave Tanya to explain that a little bit more, but that's where our collaboration started. And when we were going into the virtual space, her and I collaborated on an art appreciation group. And then I kind of audited and ran the group chat function on a sensory art group she was doing. And I was really just like blown away by it. It was a really calm space where uh, students and even family entered and TAs and teachers could enter and everyone was just making art 
with like some light music in the background. It was like really a beautiful example of how you can engage a, a wide group of folks in a virtual space. And so as, as I was kind of thinking about taking some of my work independent and the classes I wanted to offer, I reached out to Tanya and was like, hey, uh, I know your schedule is probably pretty wild with everything happening, but do you think you can squeeze me in? <laughs> and fortunately, she said yes. And so we put together an art appreciation group to run solo, and those are on Wednesday nights, and they're uh, paid for a class that's for young adults and adults, and those are self-direction approved, so folks can join uh, and get reimbursed for the money they pay. Then we also wanted to offer something that could be free and really for the community, because a lot of folks, I mean, like myself, are kind of hurting in the pandemic, right? Emotionally, financially. So we wanted to create a space uh, for those people who might not, even if it's reimbursed, have the means to join a class. So I was like, Tanya, let's think back to that sensory group. And that really didn't take much prep. Um, I like to draw. I like to write. I would probably be doing that on a weekend anyway. What if we just offer that class as a pay what you can thing? Folks can join. People who can't afford to pay can pay. And those who can't are just welcome to come and make art and hang out and have a space, especially if public spaces or the kind of hybrid classes offered places aren't safe for them right now. Uh, and that was the impetus of Open Studio. So it's on weekends. It's Saturdays, 1 to 2 p.m. Eastern. Uh, we keep it totally free. We have a suggested donation of $20 if folks are able to pay. And if not, you're still welcome to come. And what I love about it is it's a space where I'm practicing too, right? I'm using the space right now to try to get better at art. One of my kind of COVID goals is to get better at illustration, uh, both digital and physical. So I've been using it as a space to practice. And like right now I'm working on uh, perspective and trying to understand how artists use like light and shade in the work they do. And um, anyone who joins, I think some of my early drafts are pretty comical. I'm like trying to sketch coffee cups and I really probably should stick with writing, but I'm having a lot of fun learning and learning in a group too. Um, so really fortunate that Tanya joined and I'll turn it over to her to talk a little more about that. Well, you're bringing me back to my uh, high school art days when, when I did um, all of that in, in my high school art class. <laughs> And uh, it is so much fun um, here. I'm just bringing up for those watching the video on YouTube, DonnieWelchPoetry.com. And mm -hmm. here's the open studio for all where you can see the class that he just described. And I will put a link to this at the blog post today at affectautism.com. So I'm, I'm very eager to hear from you too, Tanya, about how this got started and, and about what you do. Thank you. Thanks again for having us. This is really exciting. Um, yeah, just to echo some of what Donnie said, the group started as part of a Rebecca School curriculum. I um, Every class at the Rebecca School has their own individual art time. And then we wanted to offer also a larger art group because one of the results of the pandemic is that students can't see their peers in other classrooms or some of them can't see any of their peers in person at all. So um, we wanted to think about in this world right now, we want to have just lower our expectations, um, come as you are, do what you want and um, give students an opportunity to see their peers and socialize um, we wanted it to be uh, predictable, simple, open to all ages group, um, which will give students an outlet to share their intrinsic, you know, talents and motivations with us if they want to. Um, so the group, it's pretty much the same still at Rebecca and the group we run on Saturdays, but uh, we open up, we introduce ourselves and we say, this is a space for us to be creative together. You can keep your cameras on or off. You, uh, I'm going to play some music. Um, feel free to mute the music if you don't want it. You're welcome to make art, write, or just hang out. And I feel that um, it's so empowering and regulating to just be a part of a community where you're told it's okay to do what you wanna do and we just wanna be with you. Um, so 
the groups were going really, really well at Rebecca. And we thought this is so impactful for our students. It's definitely going to be um, a, good out, um, a good outlet for other people outside of Rebecca. So Donnie said it takes place on Saturdays for an hour. And I think for me personally, it's just, <laughs> it's so regulating. Just no matter what is happening in the world, I know that on Saturday from one to two, I get to make art and see some familiar people. So I'm really happy that it's happening. That's great. Um, I, I imagine that the hour goes by quickly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it flies by <laughs> for sure. Um, yeah, I, I have so many questions, but uh, I guess the first thing that pops into my mind as a parent of a young impressionable autistic child is, um, do you have any limitations or rules about profanity, for instance, like, I don't know, in, in poetry, like, you know, in, in different types of, types of poetry, some profanity might be part of a legitimate expression, but when there's younger kids attending, the parents may not want them to hear. So do you have any sort of censorship around profanity rules or anything like that? Yeah, so um, we've had a few groups on Saturday where everybody, everyone who attended were adults, but anytime that we don't, we say um, that all this, like since this is open to a variety of ages, we want everyone to be comfortable and safe. And so all the music we play is, um, you know, PG <laughs> and uh, also we'll give a little disclosure about, um, we want you to make any art that you want, but please be mindful that if you made something um, that maybe is not appropriate for someone younger, maybe you could share it with us privately, but we haven't had profanity or any kind of gory images yet. <laughs> yeah, no, and I think there's a, there's a level of trust too, like Tanya mentioned, uh, like in the workshops I run and the groups Tanya run, it's the same folks over and over again, and we're hoping to add new folks, but when you get into the routine, you get into the rhythm of each other's work, and with that comes a level of trust. So if folks want to make something, that's great, but I don't think anyone in the group would share it, right? When we remind folks that it's an all ages space, uh, what people want to create, they can create, but whether or not they share is up to them, and everyone is pretty discerning, and we built a level of respect and trust that would I think sway people from ever wanting to share um, something like that if there was a very young child or someone who wasn't an adult or young adult in the space. So do you have, you mentioned that there were a lot of adults attending. Do you also have um, children attending with their parents? Um, so for the group specifically at Rebecca's school, uh, a lot of students are attending with their parents because they might be supported by their parents through the art process. And I found that it has become some, we've had instances where parents attended with, and the student is not even there because they feel it's kind of a an art process group. And it's like a relaxing space where we all chill. On Saturdays, we, We've either had students who are younger who are a little bit more independent, that's just by coincidence, mm -hmm. or um, adults who attended, but I haven't, haven't had parents, but parents or caregivers are certainly welcome. Yeah, in terms of age, I think the youngest person we've had is six, and the oldest person, mm -hmm. I'm not actually sure of their age, but they're a fairly old adult um, living in with some independence. Great, great. Um, I, I'm just so blown away anytime I talk to the staff at the Rebecca School because there's so much going on and everybody's so vibrant and so into the DIR model, like just really living and breathing DIR floor time in all aspects of education and in the environment. And I love seeing it branch out into the arts as well because, I mean, I know it's so important to you, Donnie, and, and I'm just meeting Tanya for the first time as an art, as an artist, an art therapist, et cetera. I'm sure art is your blood as well. 
Um, can you talk a little bit about how you got into being an art teacher and an art therapist and the DIR model and the Rebecca School? Sure. So um, thank you for saying that because there's actually, as you know, so much growing research about DIR and floor time. And there's also exponentially growing research about art therapy and like the mental health benefits of that. But there is very limited research about art therapy used within the DIR model. So uh, trying to change that. Um, I actually graduated at my bachelor's and master's in, in fine arts. And then um, I worked at different studios for a while, like office managing and uh, editing and retouching. And then I decided that I love art so much and I don't want to um, be a photographer for a magazine. I don't wanna do it in a way that I don't love it, um, so to speak, not that there's anything wrong with that. So I went to study art therapy a couple and in the meantime, uh, started working at some um, place, where did I work? <laughs> uh, Montessori and like uh, learning more about autism. So art and autism became kind of the demographic and what I wanted to do. And so I found Rebecca School and pretty much moved to New York to try to work there. Um, so I worked at Synergia for a while as um, an art teacher for um, like a ComHab Center and then um, got a job as a TA at the Rebecca School. And I, a few years in became the art teacher and then we've expanded our mental health department to offer art therapy as a service. So I'm really fortunate to be able to do that in the context of the school as well. That's wonderful. And had you heard of DIR floor time before going to Rebecca? Yeah, that's why I, how I found Rebecca. I heard of DIR floor time. I was interested, but by no means did I know, did I understand what it really was. And I just then, knew that I was working. Oh, I was just going to say that a place that utilized ABA and it just wasn't sitting with me. So I looked for something different. Right. And I mean, I can imagine if you love art, then a behavioral therapy would be so anti art <laughs> and the developmental approach really, really promotes um, everything you believe in. So I can see how the two gel together. Um, is that when you Absolutely. started taking your DIR courses once you started working at Rebecca? Yeah, I think maybe about a year in, I took 201, 202. Um, but I think you have you have to take 101 to during orientation. Great, great. So yeah, I started and kind of advanced from there. Excellent. Um, yeah, I know um, I've done a handful of podcasts. So we did the poetry one, Bonnie and I. I did a music therapy podcast with John, who was doing music therapy, John Carpente at Rebecca School back mm -hmm. in the day. And now he he works at um, his own um it, it also has Rebecca in the title, the Rebecca Center, but it's not related oh, yeah, yeah. to Rebecca School. <laughs> and then yeah. I've done a number of podcasts with Rebecca School staff about process-oriented learning. Um, and then, you know, this and, and of course, podcasts with Chris Hernandez about media and all okay. of that. And I not only do I love... DIR branching out into all these art areas that you guys are really spearheading. But I love that it's all, and I said this to Chris too, this younger generation of floor timers because Dr. Greenspan um, passed away in 2010 and a lot of his colleagues are wonderful experienced clinicians that we've all learned so much from. But as they start to retire, who's gonna carry on with floor time? And so I love being inspired by everybody at the Rebecca School, just really embracing it and pushing it forward and out in all these different areas. So I would love to hear from either one of you how floor time 
gets in the mix with the art process? Sure. Um, sure. I can start broadly and then I'll turn it over to Tanya. One thing that I particularly love and in the context of this group too, is exactly that process piece you were speaking about. Um, that's something that as someone who worked at Rebecca School was definitely drilled into me from an educational perspective and I think in a very good, meaningful way. But the, I think a lot about this open studio group, thinking about what Tanya said in terms of regulation, like how regulating of a space it is, especially in such an uncertain world. And I think there's something to be said about the process of art making that really ties into that, right? Like we're not, as a group, working on any one big collective project together. We're all working on our own individual things. But something about sharing a space, even a virtual space in that process allows us to really regulate with one another, to really co-regulate in an interesting way. A rhythm is such uh, an integral component to the workshops I do. And that's something we talked about last time I was on. And Zoom for all of its uh, good elements, so to speak. Really, you can't keep a beat together on Zoom. I don't know if we all tried clapping, it would just immediately lag out. So that was a big like hurdle for me to overcome in terms of the virtual work I was doing. And that's why I was so, it was like a light bulb moment when I was auditing that group for Tanya and heard the music. I was like, oh, duh, like let's just play some music if we can't make, a uh, make, make something rhythmic together. And so that like soothing, so to speak, rhythmic background, with this joint art making process is really just so regulating. And art making clearly exists in the higher FEDCs as well. But right now for me in particular, and I think for many of the folks and kids joining us, like regulation is something that's just so important and that's really missing from a lot of people's lives. Uh, and so in terms of this group, that's something that's in the back of my mind a lot as we're facilitating it. Yeah, I agree. Um, I also, Daria, our group, basically we say, hello, we welcome everyone. And then you're right, we, uh, mute, we're we all muted so we can uh, better support, you know, hearing the music. And then I play music and we make art. So there's no active floor time interaction going on during 45 minutes out of the hour. But um, we certainly use our um, knowledge of, you know, DIR and the floor time model when during the sharing portion and kind of try to support everybody's individual differences by acknowledging uh, why we're all muted, by giving people the, the go ahead to turn their cameras on or off or walk off screen. Um, and just uh, by giving them like the green light to do what makes them comfortable and saying that any path is okay. Yeah. yeah, and, and I, oh, I was just going to say, um, you touched on regulation, co-regulation, the I, the individual differences, and really that sense of community really is the R that you talked about at the beginning, mm -hmm. how it's this predictable, safe place to go every week where you feel safe and you feel comfortable, and it's because you've built a relationship with the people that you're Zooming with. Zooming, yeah. and, nice, I like that. Um, <laughs> making art also, I mean, has benefits for no matter what um, developmental capacity you're at that day. But what it truly does is that it's a relaxing activity and it gets you a better understanding of yourself. And by doing that, you have a better understanding of others and of the world. So we're all kind of just trying to get a better understanding of ourselves and the group together. Yeah, absolutely. I was going to jump on um, Tanya's mentioning of the cameras and kind of laying out that feature, I think is really important. Environment is something I think a lot about. And I believe that I always spoke a bit about that when we potted <laughs> last that Maybe potted shouldn't be a verb on second thought. Um, <laughs> Pod when we podcasted. Talk, when we, yeah, podcasted. That's the better iteration. And actually, um, Chris Hernandez taught me a new word, vodcast which I guess Whoa. is sort of what we're doing where it's a video podcast. So it's a vodcast. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's funny. I'm <laughs> He's an exciting dude to talk to you for sure. He and I 
uh, meet and touch base about new ed tech stuff and techie stuff. And it's always a blast. He's always teaching me something new whenever we talk. Um, yeah, I, I actually told him I might ask to jump in on them with you guys every now and then. And I might oh. consult with him about um, technology issues that I may have with my podcast because he, yeah, he's absolutely. up on all of it. He's He's got it all down. <laughs> yeah, he's been for sure. instrumental for Rebecca's school going fully virtual. So mm. he's a great resource if you need. Definitely. Yeah. But that environmental piece um, is something, it was another hurdle to kind of overcome in the virtual space. And I think this session, uh, or this group rather, accomplishes that really well. I've been like pretty involved on Instagram, social media, and seeing what teachers all around are doing in the virtual space. Um, and I, I think, I actually think I, back to this presentation that uh, Gil Tippy gave about, uh, I forget the exact title, but it was like doing less. Um, and this idea that education is always trying to do more, 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 more. And I think a lot about that when it comes to virtual work, like, like doing less. Like the actual setup of Open Studio is like pretty basic. We're not doing much more than the three of us are doing right now besides putting some music in the background, right? We don't have like an interactive Bitmoji classroom. Uh, we don't have anything wild going on. And those tools are certainly useful if you can use them right and get students engaged with them. But in an art space, I wanna create a space to make art, not to like play around with tools like that. And so having just a Zoom call, giving people the choice to have a camera on or off, and having, once again, that predictable routine of, oh, we're going to say hello and then put on some music is pretty much the virtual equivalent to the workshop spaces I use where people just come in and it's an open space with a poem up on a whiteboard. Or Tanya's groups, which often just have the art table with the supplies out, unless they're throwing clay, in which case it's like the clay wheel <laughs> with the chairs around it, which is a wild time uh, in the art room. But I think that's something really important and something for educators or teaching artists working in the virtual space to consider is like, you don't need to craft this, this like AR interactive environment. Like it's okay just to keep something simple and trust your own skills as a facilitator. Yeah, great point because I run the online parent support group for interdisciplinary council on development and learning and so many parents are struggling with the virtual schooling with their neurodiverse children. And um, I had a nice podcast with Dave Nelson from Threshold Community School, and he talked about the different challenges that they have and how they try to accommodate individual differences and, and what needs to happen in order to get through certain things. And he had a number of techniques that work, but certainly, and, and especially for something as creative as um, art, that makes so much sense to me to just make that space there and have no expectations, no demands, no pressure. And just, you know, that um, there's a developmental psychologist in Canada called Dr. Gordon Neufeld. And, and he talks about the importance of rest and play. And you need those periods of rest because that's when the creativity comes in. If you're constantly bombarded by screen time and media, your brain doesn't have time to just sit and be bored. And it's in those moments of being bored that ideas come and creativity comes. And so, um, yeah, it sounds to me like that's, that's the space that you're aiming for. It's also something I've had to adapt to when we went virtual, because it ha all happened so fast. Um, when we're in school, I try I have a room full of art materials and I try to make all these creative things and um, you know, what have you not uh, played with before? And then we went virtual and I certainly wasn't expecting parents to go to, well, actually stores were closed, but I wasn't expecting parents to be ordering obscure art supplies. So I really had to think like, what can we make with a paper towel or a toilet paper roll? Um, and I feel that it's opened up so much, there's so much more participation when you just keep it simple and people can expand on that as much as they would like, that it's something that'll stay with me even when we do one day return fully in person. I, 
I'm also curious, do you, I know you said you have this open space and, and things like that, but do you have any kind of dialogue? Like, do you say hello and have people introduce themselves? Um, does anyone talk or ask questions? Or is everybody just sitting quietly doing their own thing and just sort of watching, checking in every now and then? Uh, do you mean during our um, open, the studio? open studio? Yep. It's pretty quiet during um, the one that initially started at Rebecca School. It was much larger and a lot of the students actually utilized the chat to kind of talk to each other which was a great way to do so without, you know, distracting other people who might be drawing or just listening to music. Um, but yeah, I, at this point, it's kind of uh, a set group and people know the drill, but I always just introduce and I, I'll say what the expectations are and I'll ask if there are questions and then we'll get started. I find yeah. that people come in, they're like ready. Yeah, we keep in this group also the chat active. So that's a space for everyone to talk. Um, and like, you mentioned in our little elevator pitch, at the end, there is a share aloud piece for folks who want to do that. And so in that work, we facilitate conversation around the art, which is really mainly just us using the spotlight feature on Zoom. So that way, whoever is currently presenting can like hold up their art work and have it be what's mainly in the frame and then talk about it, uh, share their like process in making it and people can like compliment, comment. And that's really, the most like interactive piece in terms of conversation. And I imagine that's something that a lot of people might just feel comfortable watching a few times and then they oh, might yeah. get the idea in their head like, oh, I want to present mine one week, but I'm too nervous or I don't know if my art is good enough right now or whatever. But then seeing that um, from a, a number of different people, then that will sort of help them prepare for what they'll present. And um, I imagine gives them a sense of accomplishment and pride. Yeah, absolutely. for sure. We also, uh, you know, if people's cameras are off, I won't ask if they want to show. I'll just say whoever wants to show, hold it up. Um, and if someone tells me, oh, I don't want to show today, I'll just say, thank you so much for coming. I'm ha so happy you were with us. There's no right or wrong. And I also feel, I'm definitely a person who would observe first before I jumped in and shared. Um, but I feel that just saying, you don't have to do this. There's no wrong answer. People open up so much more. Yeah, I, I, I think that goes for almost anything. When you uh. request something from someone, always give them that option to say no. And they're more likely to say yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Something I um, learned a little too late in my life. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so I'm curious if you noticed that you start to get um, any collaborations going. Like, I guess, you know, maybe some students see someone else's art and they say, oh, I want to do that too. Or someone's drawing, but maybe another person's painting. And maybe a third person is, I don't know, sculpting, like whatever other art medium people might be using and they might be interested in doing that. Do you, A, do you have any demonstrations on how to do things like, or any like kind of art lessons or is that sort of something separate? And then secondly, do you see people collaborating with each other or even just having conversations, I guess, aside sure. from the review part? Cool. The... Um, I think in, well, Donnie and I, make art throughout the group. So he'll do um, either some sketching or writing and I will draw or doodle and we kind of have our cameras down. So uh, we're not watching people, but they can see what we're doing. I have noticed people referencing other student, like student to student artwork. So somebody will draw a pumpkin, someone else goes and grabs an orange crayon, um, if that's what you mean. There's definitely, you'll see somebody use this material and next week someone else has it. So people are getting ideas from each other, but um, beyond that, I think there's the collaboration is just in them speaking to each other. 
um, and just referencing each other's work. Uh, but what? as far as art lessons, that's a we that's a separate thing. Yeah, um, one thing that has been happening though that's interesting. There's uh, besides me a poet in the group who will often tend to reference some of the songs happening. I find so when they share their work, there are often either like thematic similarities or little bits of lyrics uh, that make their way in. Uh, I'm trying to think of one there's on our little like loop, uh, our playlist loop is uh, The Boxer by Simon and Garfunkel. And there is this one line that just like really jumped out at me and now I can't for the life of me remember. I was like, is that, is that from The, the Boxer? And he's like, yeah. I was like, oh, word, I really hear that. So there's instances like that that have proven pretty cool where uh, maybe not the peer-to-peer -peer referencing is happening, but definitely the space, there's some reference and acknowledgement of some of what we've set up. Cool. Um, I, I want to ask you guys if you have any examples of any artwork, but I actually have one for you. Hey. This was sent to me by a mom in Italy, and her and her daughter made this at the beginning of the quarantine, and apparently it means all is good, all will be good. Um, wow. That's so great. Yeah, yeah, that's really cool. Yeah, I love it. Actually, I if if you guys are okay, I'll use this as the photo for our podcast for the blog post. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I love the double rainbow effect. I love like the framing of the piece is so well done. Like instead of just tucking everything under one, the fact that it's like the double loop and then each heart is kind of tucked under its own arc is really, yeah. really well done. What an yep. uplifting, nostalgic image. Yeah, yeah. Yep, I love it. Yep, it's great. Um, do you guys have any, I mean, I see some nice artwork behind Donnie there. Um, <laughs> yeah. Do you guys have any examples? And and also, I like I heard you say, Donnie, that you're writing. So it's not necessarily drawing, painting, sculpting art, but it's also writing during yeah. the open studio. You could also be writing or. Yeah, definitely. Um, um, so writing is certainly open. I don't, I don't have, I don't think Tanya has, unless maybe she does any of the participants work. I have some of my work I can definitely show. Um, I'll get off camera for a second and grab uh, a poem I made and I'll let Tanya speak while I'm Sounds off good. scene. Sure, sure. Um, I don't have any art here that I've made for the group, but I'd be happy to share some with you. One of my teachers growing up or in uh, when I first started college, always said that if you don't know what to draw and you're stuck, just make circles. So I've been stuck a lot and I've been doing this in group. So I'll just draw an orb and kind of fill it in with watercolors. Um, so I'd be happy to share those with you. Sure. So I've been thinking a lot about uh, what I'll show our visual poems. Um, in part, another colleague and I are gonna be talking at the ICDL conference about some work we did around visual poetry. So there's a shameless plug. But while I've been thinking a lot like academically and presentation wise about visual poetry, I was also working on some. So here is a little visual haiku I made. Uh, the haiku reads, let's see if I can get it all in frame. Autumn wind rushes in, impatient leaves. And the leaf work in our art appreciation class, Tiny and I were doing a session on Matisse um, and Matisse's like cutout style, the leaf and nature work was really on my mind. So a lot of the cutout work is inspired by uh, that other class. So there's that. And then the I first absolutely thing, love it. That's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. I have, uh, let's see if I can show you, I have some like zigzaggy scissors that I mm -hmm. used. Um, and I pretty rarely use them. I just have like a bag of tricks from workshops and going like place to place as a teaching artist. And I have, I tricks, have, uh, I have those scissors in my sewing box that I haven't used in about 20 years. <laughs> yeah, bust them out, make some leaves. Um, and then my other one uh, is a found poem. So here's all the cutouts in a bag. There's this little booklet I found called Ghost Tours of York. It is in a free box. It's like some uh, ghost tour pamphlet for York, England. Uh, so I grabbed that. Then I made this kind of eerie Halloween cutout. It's meant to look like a throne room, maybe from like Game of Thrones or Lord of the Rings, something kind of spooky and haunted. 
Um, and all this work is some of that like rough, thicker cut uh, cover that I cut out and layered and layered and layered. And the black and white are pictures from the book itself. Um, and the text reads, uh, the title is The King's Manor. And it reads, the singing of an old Irish song. The carry dances, drifting straight through the walls, straight through me as I sat in this place. There's that. Awesome. And yeah, I love fun. Found poetry is actually something I really love to model. I find it a really like accessible iteration of poetry because it involves taking something and just doing a lot of cutting and gluing um, and really like self-selecting the words that resonate with you. So it's something that I really love to model and really love to teach. So I started off our sessions making this found poem. I think it took me like three, three sessions for it to finish it, all the artwork included. I yeah, also noticed the, when Donnie was working on the eerie poem at the end when we were sharing, a lot of people's artwork was a little bit, you know, yeah, Halloween-y, like dark, uh, not inappropriate in any way, but uh, just is reminds me that we are referencing each other, even if it's subconsciously through this group. Absolutely. And are you also still teaching at the Rebecca School during this pandemic, Tanya? Yes, I am. So the Rebecca School was fully virtual up until the end of summer. And now we have reopened as a hybrid model. So there are two cohorts, um, cohort A and cohort B, and um, everyone pretty much teaches in person two days a week and then from home three days a week. Okay, and how does that look like now? I imagine you've had to make quite a bit of changes. Yeah, there's actually the students are doing great and adapting really well to wearing a mask and kind of respecting personal space. The school is taking a lot of precautions um, and doing all they can to keep it uh, with PPE and keep the space safe. Um, there's definitely materials that are we're not using right now, or um, you know, there's no bubbles, there's no singing, but it's working well. What I sort of chose is um, students who I thought would benefit more from being in person, who maybe uh, weren't necessarily accessing Zoom or art on Zoom as well as some. So those students I see in person and then um, I sort of figured if it's not broke, don't break it. So if students were doing really well um, in virtual learning for art class, then we kept those. And I'm just curious, what are the ages of the kids in the art programs at Rebecca School? So I see all the students that go to Rebecca School. Um, every classroom receives art, so from three to 21. Oh, wow. <laughs> so I, I am quite curious how you do art with the younger kids. And I guess when I say younger, I'm thinking about my son, who's not that young, he's 11 and a half, but he's only recently started drawing anything. So he was always fist holding and scribbling. And just recently in the last, I don't know, four or five months, um, maybe, maybe longer, he'll sort of draw a happy face, but he just sort of does a circle and eyes and a mouth. And now he started to draw like lines from the head mm -hmm. and it, it, it's not really a body. It's just a bunch of lines. And then he might even draw a line across, but he's very quick. He doesn't like spend time. He's just, <laughs> and puts a pencil down. And that's about the extent of his art. Um, I know at his school, they're starting to color. And again, I've only seen him just scribble, 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 and, you know, right over the faces, right over other things. And I've had um, our DIR people suggest that, you know, the emotions on the face are hard for him. So that could be why he's scribbling out faces when he colors and when he, even on pictures, if he sees photographs of kids, he just scribbles out the face. <laughs> and mm -hmm. so I have to be careful if it's a picture I want to keep for, I had a, his nice cute school picture up on the fridge and he like scribbled his face out. I was like, oh, <laughs> um, 
but in, in drawing, they're starting to get him to color and try and stay within the lines. And so it's a very basic, um, basic introduction to art. So what do you do with someone like that who's right at the beginning stages and, and really with the motor planning issues doesn't really know what to do next? Yeah, thanks for asking that. So actually a lot of people, maybe rightfully so, think about art as like drawing, painting, sculpture, um, maybe coloring, but um, I definitely, art doesn't look like that at Rebecca's school. Um, a lot of the younger kids, it's more sensory based. So we might make different doughs. We might um, read a book about color mixing and then mix different inks. We might squish two plates together to see what happens to the paint. Um, I'm not really interested in the finished product unless the student is. I definitely want to support their interest and uh, you know, encourage them to draw if that's what they're doing. But um, if they're not interested in holding a crayon, then we will do something different. I really just, I think of art as um, being creative with new materials. So um, if somebody's building a sculpture out of, you know, toilet paper rolls or boxes, somebody else could be drumming on the box and that's perfectly fine. They're sharing space with us and enjoying themselves. Um, I also feel that since going virtual, a lot of the students who might not be doing any intricate, more intricate um, crafts are doing them now because the parents are doing, are helping out. Um, so that's part of it, but it's definitely not a requirement. We do a lot of we've done tie dye and color dipping, and um, we do things like scavenger hunts, like go look for something that's red. Um, we play a lot of games, kind of uh, freeze dance, only freeze draw. So we'll show you know a line or a circle, and then I play music, and for a minute and a half, let's see what everybody else makes from the circle. Um, so definitely there's no kind of prerequisite to have, to be artistic or to be able to color in the lines or hold a crayon. Oh, those are all amazing examples. And I think my son would love all of those things, especially <laughs> mixing the colors and anything to do with like explosions and, you know, messy stuff, even yeah. though he doesn't like getting his hands messy, he loves watching the mess. <laughs> So and that's perfect. Imagine. We have yeah. students who watch and if that's how they want to participate, that's great, right? They're sharing space and they're engaging. Yeah, and I mean, when Donnie was talking about the art, the last thing I thought about was cutting out shapes and pasting them on a paper and and using words too, like that didn't even cross my mind. And, and of course, uh, possibilities are endless with art. So um, I think like you said, your teacher said to you, if you don't know what to do, just start with drawing circles. Um, similarly, I think some of the kids may not have any ideas of what to do, but then you give them all these different examples and then at least they see, oh, I like, I wanna do that. And it gives them a starting point. And from there they branch out and bring in their own ideas and build upon those. Yeah, thank you, for sure. That's great, yeah. I'm going to pull up the Web page for the ICDL conference. Hey. Because I will also be speaking at the ICDL conference. And so, yeah, Bonnie. I saw you on there. So, um, I encourage everybody to sign up. It's a virtual conference this year. There are presentations from November 1st to the end of the month almost every day, um, multiple presentations a day. And for parents, it's only $49, and you get access to every single one. And they're all live. They're not recordings. They're all live. That's basically um, the Interdisciplinary Council on Development and Learning's shtick is that we do everything live and interactive. So this is the schedule. There are multiple times that things are shown. So there's still the whole rest of November to check it out. So I hope that people will look into that if they haven't already. And um, do you know which day offhand you're presenting? Uh, they're both Mondays, I believe. 
The first is Monday the 9th. That's our afternoon slot, so it's 1 p.m. And then Monday the 23rd is our late night, so it's 8 p.m. Here we go. Oh, the aim is song, poetry, rhythm, and the art of communication. So that'll be amazing. Looking forward to seeing you at the conference as well. Oh, thank you. I will put the links in the blog post at affectautism.com. And is there anything else that you wanted to share about the art studio or about any of the other work that we've talked about or about how it relates to DIR floor time? Here it is. Cool. Before uh, we sign off. Or... No, we're running sessions through November. Um, so if you get this a little late, and are like, oh man, November 21st is coming gone. Don't worry, we'll be back after the holidays in January. So you can stay tuned on this website page that Daria is sharing. You can email me at donnywelchpoetry at gmail.com. Um, and I'll have the dates up for our winter spring sessions, probably honestly fairly soon. Uh, I'd like to have them ready by December. So if, like I said, if you're seeing this late, just please contact me, email me, and I'll let you know when we're back uh, starting January or February, running through spring. Excellent. Yeah, I, I'm thrilled to have learned more about this. And I'm just so inspired by you guys inspiring others to get into art. So thank you so much for yeah, everything. Thank you for having us. Thank you so much for having us. It's nice to meet you and sort of in person. You too. <laughs> Until next time, here's to affecting autism through play.